let's begin by thinking about what science does. We start with a picture of the world that we developed as Neanderthals or before then because it was useful maybe for getting around but what we find is that we apply our minds and our observational techniques and our theoretical techniques we can find out the world is entirely unlike what we've evolution has trained us up as as apes to believe it is and this began certainly at least with Copernicus what's more obvious than that the Sun rises and moves across the sky and sets what could be a more manifest fact of experience than that but now we know but now we know it's just an illusion <laughs> now, how did we find that out? We looked at the best scientific theories we had. We put aside our prejudices. We put aside the way the world seems to us. And we looked clearly at the mathematics. And we asked it to tell us what's real. Now, in the progress of science, already by the time of Newton, you look at his fundamental equations, and let's, we'll do this in two steps. First, the direction of time. And those equations do not require or have in them any direction. They're entirely indifferent about going from a certain time to the future or a certain time to the, back, to the past. If physics doesn't need it, we don't need it. So much as you may want to hold on to your old time beliefs that you're getting older, <laughs> clear thought will show you that this is mere appearance. Now, that was just the first step. At least with Newton, there was some distinction, you might think, at least between time and space. But then Einstein, we know now space and time become combined, so they say, one large four-dimensional object. Four dimensions stretching out equally in different directions. Why pick one and treat it differently than the others? Moral progress, moral progress of the universe has been toward greater equality. <laughs> Scientific progress should be the same. So, in all directions. Now, this, there's no more, that's right, you have a, a basic object which you should think of as neither spatial nor temporal. And this is, a, again, the third thing, quantum mechanics. We all know if we tried to get down, we have our macroscopic view of the world we've gotten from being these big things. We know if we got down to Planck scale, all of these pictures we have of the macroscopic world would not be applicable at all. There'd be no more distinction between different sorts of directions, you have something which is not properly thought of as either spatial or temporal from which this appearance merely emerges as a kind of good approximation. But if it's neither spatial nor temporal, it's not temporal. The time part of it obviously can't be real. And you're just holding on to nostalgia and illusion <laughs> if you continue to believe it. Thank you. Stand up to this and be the defender, the vanguard of time. <laughs> oh, most definitely. The defender of time 
I have to say, as has been said twice already, that's going to be a hard act to follow. Um, he has spoken with great wit. I'm going to speak with great passion from personal experience. And uh, just to make sure I don't forget, forgive me if I have a few notes, but I'm going to start with experimental evidence. And nothing can be more sure and definite than one's own experience. And I have a very, very strong feeling of continued existence through time. Very vivid memories of my childhood. Uh, so I have a very strong sense of personal time. And I should also say that uh, uh, I, I'm, no one is more punctual than I am. <laughs> And if anybody <laughs> likes to deny it, I'll, I'll, I'll have a fight with them afterwards. <laughs> Punctuality is the courtesy of kings. I do believe in that. Uh, and uh, I should also say that uh, I have a great person, and this is absolutely true, I have an absolute fascination for the study of history as a linear process. I think it's absolutely absorbing. Um, now I want to come down to psychological experience, which I think is, is very important. We must, science must always be looking forward to encompass more things. And if you think about it, absolutely nothing is more vital and exciting than the sense of becoming. And there is some crazy chap called Tim Maudlin. <laughs> who wrote a book called The End of Time, wanting to take that absolutely out of the story. It's, he transformed the universe into the, a morgue. <laughs> he actually had the cheek to put it in his book. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say a little bit about this fascination of becoming. Well, there is this I think many people who are really romantic and, and, and passionate will say that change is primary and being is secondary. I mean, what a load of nonsense to say that nouns come before verbs. Of course verbs come first. It's got to be something happening. Unless you're German. Uh, <laughs> 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 and at this point, I want to become very serious because the thing that really fascinates me about the universe is spontaneity. And you see this in, in art. The, now, last Thursday, I was, uh, you see, I have to say last Thursday, it's absolutely clear, you know, that was two or three days ago. <laughs> there was this lovely conference at Warwick University about time. <laughs> just like this on a small scale, beautiful thing. And there was a fabulous talk by a cellist in the resident quartet there. And he was talking all about how they have to keep time, they count like mad, they don't, you don't see it, but they're counting like mad. And, and it's tremendous tight discipline. But then I, I said to him, I'd once heard Janet Baker talking on the radio. I greatly admire her, she's one of my favorite singers. And she was asked, if in a performance in one opera she'd done something really wonderfully one evening, would she try and repeat it the next performance? And she said, absolutely no. You kill the magic of the now, that complete unpredictability of what is coming. And there's something so tremendously strong in that sense of vitality, change, something new. And she spoke about having a rapport with, with, with the conductor, and it would be completely unpredictable. He would, perhaps he would indicate something, let's go slightly differently, and then she would do it, and then something quite magical would come out of. So all of this persuades me right in my core that there is something very deep there, and, and you have to have this Bergsonian feeling of moving forward, that it's, that it's very deep there. So. And the quartets, what it comes down to, all that training, all those hours and hours of training, it's then actually to liberate them to have that freedom to do things spontaneously and bring things forward. I think that's really, I could go into more scientific arguments, but I think I'll keep that for my discussion tomorrow. So 
I hope I've persuaded you on that basis that we should take time and becoming as very serious, and that is, that is, that's much more important than being. To, to, to hell with old Plato, he was a dead old dog. <laughs>